thanks for coming on, Rob. Um, Pleasure. And thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with a bit about um, your background and maybe if you can give the listeners a bit of an idea of your previous approach to how you treated patients and then maybe the transition you went through to, I guess, your current uh, approach to treating patients and, and, sure. and the lifestyle diseases. Sure. Oh, well, thanks very much for the very kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I – look, it's been, a, it's been a journey for me and it continues to be a journey, and I think that's uh, something that um, – I think needs to be encouraged is the idea that when we graduate from a medical school that it's not the end of our learning and it's actually just the kind of the beginning of our learning and um you know I think often we'll preface to patients that I don't think that everything that I think right now is necessarily right and I know that that's probably the case because if I think back to a year ago to 10 years ago to 15 years ago that certainly the even back to 6 months ago that certainly the way that I view topics and um elements of healthcare uh, has evolved, has changed. And so some of the ways in which some of the con- concepts concepts that I had, you know, even six months ago have shifted a bit. So certainly, you know, I think that's that's the thing that I am kind of excited about with, with my practice is that it's not just rinse and repeat, but it's, it's kind of a learning evolution for me and um, which I guess just really kind of underlines the question that you asked which is about how has it kind of shifted and I guess it, it had a quite a quite a seismic shift back about probably nine years ago now and um prior to that let me have a think so that was yeah it was kind of yeah about 2014 or something like that um you know prior to that I'd already been like I graduated in 99 so I'd already been practicing for maybe what you know 13 14 years um in a kind of very you know cookie cutter standard paradigm kind of regular doctor kind of way if you can use that terminology and um you know i guess when you think about it then i've actually been practicing in a different more holistic more ancestrally appropriate approach for a lot less uh than i had been doing that kind of standard paradigm so i'm really familiar with with that mindset and i certainly know when when doctors are questioning some of the ways in which I view approaches to healthcare, um, I can certainly understand where they're coming from just because it's just so different to what we're taught. And, um, yeah, that, that shift really took place. And I, I think this is really true for a lot of the people that practice in this way, whether they're doctors, nurses, dietitians, or any other therapist really, is that it's, you know, through your own personal health journey. And the thing, the thing is that the most, um, convincing, um, for any intervention, whether it's dietary or any other lifestyle or drug or anything, any intervention, is lived experience. And that's no different for anyone who's a, a doctor or any other type of therapist for that matter. So that's when my lived experience really shifted and I had a quite a seismic kind of shift in my own thing because of my um, own health journey. And it was um, at that time that I was diagnosed with what was then thought to be type 2 diabetes and had been diagnosed as type 2 diabetes by an endocrinologist and, you know, my all of my healthcare team and a dietitian and the whole lot. And that was quite a shock because I actually felt pretty good and I was exercising a lot. I was, you know, going to the gym like six days a week and lifting lots of weights and really enjoying that and feeling really good. And it was only through a work medical that I um, found this HbA1c of 7.7 and a fasting glucose of 9, um, which, you know, at first I was in denial about and thought, oh, the lab must have mixed my blood up with someone <laughs> the diabetic's blood. Uh, and so, you know, promptly went to my GP and got another set done and, yeah, pretty well confirmed. And uh, I was only 37 at the time. So, um, you know, I, I thought, wow. I, I remember saying to myself during medical school, learning about diabetes and all the myriad of things that happened is that that's kind of the one disease I really don't want. And here I was with it, you know, a tender age of 37, decades ahead of me of time in which to develop all the complications. So that was really kind of horrible, you know, and it was a real kick in the guts. Like I, I, I think unless you've been through something like that, it's 
pretty hard to understand just, you know, how, but particularly when, you know, you're espousing so-called health information to your patients and you're, you know, because I was really trying to focus on being healthy or what I thought was healthy and and there I was, you know, with diabetes and a, a disease that, you know, is attributed to a poor lifestyle. So that was hard, and but you know I um, got myself together, got onto some metformin, saw a dietitian who actually, interestingly enough, said to me I was eating pretty much perfectly uh, according to the standard guidelines, uh, nothing to change really, and uh, life went on for about a year until a kind of friend, a friend of mine actually, I, I didn't, to, you know, it's my embarrassment, I didn't actually do a lot of my own research by that point, but a friend of mine who. Um, was a physiotherapist, was a really big fan of Tim Noakes. And he was touring Australia, speaking at a low-carb down-under conference at St Kilda Town Hall, and he went along to that. And then just casually mentioned to me, oh, he'd been at this thing that he felt like was a cult event <laughs> on the weekend and was telling me about it. And uh, he said, oh, they're, they're even talking about that you can potentially reverse type 2 diabetes. Of course, my ears pricked up and I hadn't actually shared with him about my diagnosis, but I, you know, immediately became very interested. And so that night went home and did a whole lot of um, reading and lecture watch, watching and and really kind of um, immersed myself in that. And that was kind of where it began, I guess. It's it's just through that, that whole um, not very pleasant journey, but it, it really... Um, well, I guess, you know, then I implemented that, you know, within days and actually just did an experiment where I was just, you know, back then pricking myself and um, stopped my metformin on the same day that I stopped eating carbohydrates. And I basically had normal blood glucose levels. Like I was in the fives and sixes off metformin, off carbohydrates. So I thought, I mean, I had that immediate biofeedback of knowing that this is a powerful intervention and kind of haven't really looked back as far as, you know, Having, I, was, I had a pretty, you know, look sugary, starchy diet. Lot, lots of, you know, skinless chicken breast and broccoli as well, <laughs> uh, and oats and whatnot. Um, but had, you know, quite a few sweet treats. And and looking back, I'd had a hell of a lot of seed oils. I was raised on flour, sugar, and seed oil. Really, as a child. Mm. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So that. That was kind of that that first part, and and certainly for many many years, then um, I put the diabetes into remission, and ended up with hba one cs in the mid fives, off medication, and uh, yeah, thought I'd reverse my type two diabetes. Mm. And that's a fascinating insight. Thanks, Rob. And it, I guess it it as you mentioned, it speaks to this idea of even as clinicians, we need to go through some form of individual personal health journey before we're truly able to internalize the uh, the reality of of our patients and in this case the ability to reverse uh type 2 diabetes um with just purely on a on a dietary and a lifestyle mm. basis so so i guess well, from- that, sorry if i can just interrupt just for a sec max mm. you know and I, I don't want to take away from all of those clinicians who haven't had that i mean i think even more you know hats off to those men and women who haven't had to go through that and yet can see the power of this intervention and, and espouse it in the clinical practice. I mean, like that is really awe-inspiring for me. So thank you to all those people. Mm. So I guess we you got to a stage where you'd personally seen the power of dietary modification, particularly reducing the carbohydrate intake um, and eliminating polyunsaturated seed oils from the diet. And you'd had this amazing improvement biochemically in that you'd gone from a diabetic HbA1c to non-diabetic HbA1c for for, for the listeners the HbA1c is is a basically an averaged um a proxy marker of of a 2 to 3 month uh, average blood glucose level so you you'd got to that stage and then at that point you you obviously realized well my my practice as a general practitioner has to change um if I'm going to incorporate and, and help people based on my own um finance. Well, that's when you, you get confronted by a choice, you know, and it's a difficult one because, well, it depends. But, you know, it 
practicing this way is a lot harder. I mean, I can recall just how easy it was to just order blood tests, provide a kind of fairly meaningless kind of commentary on that blood test and then just, you know, prescribe. See you later. See you in, you know, three or six months, you know, and it's pretty easy to do that, really. You don't, it doesn't take a lot of effort. You get out on time and you're not keeping people waiting in a, in a full waiting room. And then the, the flip side of that is seeing the effect that this has had on me. And the other thing was that I just, you know, shed about so that uh, eight to 10 kilograms in body fat as well without losing any muscle, you know, I kept my strength and, um, so I got leaner. So the more I sort of, you know, read and educated myself about this and the more I realized it was just, you know, dynamite for obesity treatment as well. And so then it, the, the, the choice then is presented to you, you know, do you go to the, you swim against the current, number one, um, recommending a diet that's full of, you know, saturated fat and uh, low carbohydrate, no grains, you know, which is meant to be, you know, according to the standard paradigm, the bedrock of a healthy diet. Um, I mean, I, even as recently as last week, I had a dietitian ask me whether there was any safety data for excluding grains from the diet. I mean, it's just such a um, brainwashing that you must include grains to be healthy. It's bizarre. Like, and mm. my answer, of course, was show me the evidence for the safety of a grain-based diet. Mm. I'd love to see that data because that doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a choice, you know, and, and I guess the, ultimately it comes down to whether or not, you know, um, for me anyway, I think everybody needs to kind of approach this in their own unique personal way. But for me, it was a decision about whether or not I could really kind of look at myself in the mirror every morning and, and be, you know, authentic in doing what I was doing for myself, knowing that that was the best thing for me and and then recommending that for my patients as well. And I guess there was just no two ways about it. I wasn't going to be able to not do this. Although, um, like I say, it, it does take a lot more effort. Mm. So, so I guess we can... Um... I guess thinking about how now you you approach health and your patients, you've basically gone from a, a model, a traditional general practitioner model, of of uh, prescription medication based care to one of holistic dietary and lifestyle. So I guess how if you say uh, an average patient is coming to you and a new patient is coming to you and they're a bit overweight, um, they haven't seen a doctor in a, in a long time, um, and you, they're basically a, a blank, a blank sl- uh, slate for you. What is your general approach in terms of that patient, and what are the metrics that you're thinking about in order to um, appraise that person's health status, um, and perhaps uh, thinking about their, their metabolic health? Well, I um, there's a whole list of um, elements to that, but the, probably the one of the most powerful things actually is that I'm, I'm really fortunate in um, the, the general practice where I'm working now is that I've enabled, um, been given the luxury of having some nurses take some observations for me before they come into the room. So they've already, um, you know, they've booked in for whatever, a sore ankle or whatever, but they've already been kind of through height, weight, waist circumference, blood pressure, heart rate, all that's been done before I've seen them and actually... Um, the interesting effect of that is that people, it opens a conversation. Regardless of what else they might be there for, they're like, uh, quite often people will say, I have no idea, I put on so much weight, you know, or whatever. Um, so I guess just first of all, bring it, bringing attention to it. And, and, and the good thing about it, about that approach that has been helpful, is that I haven't had to raise it as a topic because it's already been kind of alluded to in that process. So, but sometimes if I do, then I think, you know, um, waste measurement, I, I think is the most useful single metric. And, you know, it's not perfect, not, nothing is, but it's the most simple and, um, you know, I, I always go for like 90 centimetres, 90 centimetres around the abdomen for a male, um, obviously depending on their kind of structure, you know, their bony structure, you know, if you're, heavy set you might be 94 if you're really fine boned and 
narrow pelvis, you might need to be 86, you know, but you kind of gauge that. And for a female, about 80 centimetres, which is kind of halfway between the bottom of the ribs and the top of the hip bone, kind of along that point there. Um, and again, just depending on structure and ethnicity and whatever. But that's a really good way, you know, I, and it's good to divert it away from weight. You know, weight, I think, has the um, element of aesthetics and to draw it back to health. It's good to talk about organ fat and the waist measurement is a really good tool to just draw attention to that you know like we're not talking about your beach body we're talking about whether you've got organ fat and you know most people now know that you know if you've got fat around your organs that's risky so um to that and then but then obviously you know there's a whole lot of different blood work um the um liver tests you know to look for any evidence of fatty liver alt ggt being the most useful um then fasting insulin Obviously, fasting glucose, obviously HbA1c, as you mentioned, and looking for any pre-diabetes with, you know, HbA1c five up to five point six being normal, five point seven, six point four being pre. Basically, mid fives to mid sixes is kind of pre. Six point five and above being diabetes, and these these are all shades of grey. And there's, you know, uh, we shouldn't draw rigid lines in the sand with these shades of grey. And there's lab error. I've had people that have come back with a 0.3 difference in HbA1c on the same day, measured twice. You know. So again, we've got to realise that nothing's perfect, even measurements, because humans do them and and they're fallible. So, um, so that's useful. Um, triglycerides, HDL, and looking at that triglyceride to HDL ratio is really useful. I think to do that triglycerides divided by HDL, um, you know, less than one preferably. So you, you basically want your triglycerides to be less than your HDL, preferably half that of your HDL. And, you know, many people within, and, and that's a surrogate marker of insulin resistance. Uh, so, you know, the higher that triglyceride to HDL ratio, the worse we are. So, you know, if it's two or three or four, you know, we're progressively getting worse. So preferably a triglyceride to HDL ratio of 0.5, but I, I certainly think one is okay. Um, yeah, the, oh, the other one that's kind of interesting that's often marked normal, but it may not be, is urea. Uh, and I use that as kind of a, as a surrogate marker of protein intake. And depending on the lab, but that range, normal range, can be something like um, two or three up to about eight, something like that. But I, I like to get it on the upper end of that. If someone's coming in with a urea of three, uh they're going to be muscle wasting, you know. They'll, they'll come back without anything asterisked. It'll look normal. But, you know, I, I don't think – basically urea is is a byproduct of utilisation of protein in the diet, which is predominantly for structural components, but it's also a byproduct of utilisation for energy, but it's mainly proteins, not usually that. It's usually structural use of protein. And, and basically the, the less uh, protein you have in your diet, lower your urea, urea and vice versa. So that's another really interesting thing. And often vegans and vegetarians will get a urea of, you know, three or four. Um, certainly, you know, someone who's eating lots of meat will get a level that's kind of five and above. And if it's a bit above the cutoff, I'm happy with that. Like if it's nine or ten, if as long as we can explain it with a lot of meat in the diet and no worries and, and with a normal creatinine, um, indicating the kidneys are okay you know so i guess putting it all into context is the thing yeah and so basically what what you're saying rob is that rather than a conventional gp who is content with say uh, an hba1c under 6.5 you're really looking at all these different markers that together are, are pointing like clues towards right. a diagnosis of right. prediabetes indicators of insulin resistance and basically together indicating that someone is on a path to chronic disease and i want to make that that clear to to the listener that the point of measuring these markers the point of holistically looking at this patient is because we want to prevent uh, identify and prevent the progression of insulin resistance because it is at the core of so many chronic diseases and and if we can as a pathological process address that early then we're preventing 
a whole range of 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 um, suffering later down the track. Yeah, I mean, these are all just different branches on the same tree. All these different mm. diagnoses that you can get. You know, this is basically the, the the trunk is the insulin resistance, right? But all the different branches include a whole lot of dozens of different diseases that are basically at their core have that insulin resistance. So whether it's weight gain or type two diabetes or high blood pressure or gout, gallstones, Alzheimer's, a whole raft of different cancers, um, atherosclerosis. Uh, and then a lot of the autoimmune diseases are really much more common, osteoarthritis, you know, your polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm. So you kind of like, you know, basically it's the, the top 100 list of the things, the diagnoses that you get people walking into the door of general practice except for trauma really and lacerations, you know, mm. with the, those things. Um, and, and even mood disorders will be heavily influenced by by this, you know, and the other thing I forgot to mention with the list of, met, of um, blood tests was uh, high sensitivity CRP, an inflammatory marker, and and uh, that often there's low grade inflammation, and again similar to sort of you know I, I I think I would have in the past have just sort of looked to see whether someone was very inflamed, but now like low levels of inflammation is kind of like ooh, you don't really want that long term. I mean it could just be something because there are literally a million things that can put that up, including an ingrown toenail or. A, you know, sinus infection. But um, if it's like that all the time, that's an indicator that there's just a smoldering level of inflammation and that's the kind of thing that's going to cause you to have an event, a disease. Mm. You know? Yeah. And, and I really want to emphasise this because for the average person, they're not aware that they even got a condition that is predisposing them and actively harming them. And because they're a regular GP that they're seeing isn't measuring their waist circumference, isn't making a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, they don't realize or they don't, don't understand that they that, that there's something um, medically wrong with them. And the, the ubiquity and the prevalence of obesity and overweight in Australia today, mm. similarly to all countries around the world, is getting to a point where we're normal, it's almost normal to be overweight. Right. Right, and right. and and the point that that I want to stress, and the way you practice, Rob, is that every time a patient's coming through the door and having that waist circumference measured, we're saying actually, no, you're not healthy. Right, um, this isn't normal. You're right. on a path. You're on a track to chronic disease, and we want to identify that because we want to help you avert the consequences. Yeah. And this is this is the key point that I think. Um, you know, p- patients are being kind of failed by a system that says, don't worry until your HbA1c is 6.5. Even though we've got reams of data that suggests an increased risk of cardiovascular event, stroke. You're basically um, on, a, on, a, on a path, you know, you're yeah. getting sicker and sicker. Hmm. So that's right. Yeah, I couldn't have put it better myself, Max. Like we just want to, I mean, let people know. And, and it's not our job to tell anyone what to do. Hmm. We're all our own master. So I'm not here to tell anyone you must do X, Y, Z, you know, but it is my job to say this is what's going on inside your body. These are your options. What do you want to do, right? And and if we're not doing that, if we're not identifying it to people, because, you know, the number of doctors that have said to me, oh, but people are not interested in changing their lifestyle. People don't want to change their diet. People like what they're eating and, and as if just to, to, to kind of give up and die. Like, mm, it's yeah, not, not even try. Just, you're right. It's not our job to, to just give up. Uh, and apart from the fact that when tested, this theory is disproven. I mean, I've lost count of the number of times that I've kind of said to people, like, I don't know, I've just noticed that you've got a lot of the analogy I use for all of these different blood tests and markers, whether it's waist circumference, is like different windows into the same room. You know, you might get somebody that lights up like a Christmas tree with all of their measurements. You know, they've got inflammation, high triglycerides, low HDL, high fasting insulin, raised HbA1c, um, you know, the, the whole kitten, uh, liver function tests that are abnormal. And people go, oh, my God, I've got like six different diseases. How, you know, how come I didn't know about this? It's like, no, you have one. These are just different ways of measuring the same thing. You know, you have fatty blood. You have fatty liver, you probably have fatty everything, fatty skeletal muscle, fatty cardiac, heart muscle, fatty pancreas. You know, you probably have fatty everything, really. But we're just measuring it in different areas, right? And um, hyperinsulinemia, you know, that goes hand in hand. That's what's, you know, it's all part of the same. 
basically different windows into that same room. And, um, you know, when you present that to somebody and you kind of go, well, this is the, the root cause of like 90% of the diseases that I'm seeing every day, um, it's reversible. Is that something you're interested in? The responses I get are, are amazing because people are interested in their health. I mean, to think that people are not interested in their health is really, really kind of kind of negating the, the evidence in front of our eyes. You know, people are interested in their health. They're just being given a bum steer. You know, the number of people who have shed tears to me who want to lose weight and have been doing that, trying to do that their whole life, who feel like they're a failure and, you know, um, they're overcome by emotion when I say to them, no, you have not failed. You have been failed. Mm. You know, the advice has failed you, right? Um, this is, you've always just been given the wrong information. But when mm. you're given the right information, you need to bring your insulin down. You know, you need to give yourself predominantly the building blocks, the structural components of who you are, what makes you up, not energy. So don't focus on energy, focus on structure in your diet, fat and protein. Mm. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and we've talked about before, and I think you mentioned patients patients will feel like they they don't feel well they yeah. they have a notion <laughs> they they have an idea in their head i mean is this what health is supposed to be like and they they don't feel well and then when you are able to give them a hard number like say well look your waist circumference is above what what is is normal or is healthy your fasting insulin is 20 it's above what what is healthy then you you're finally piecing together Mm. what their their individual personal experience and, and reality for them absolutely and then mood mm. you know mood experience comes into that too because if you are metabolically unwell if you've got metabolic disease with all of these features that doesn't stop at the neck mm. you know and and you know if you've got um there's a there's a whole raft of it's not just that you have a bit of a few fat, fat globules in your in your liver there's a whole derangement of the pathways of the way that the body should be working all the different enzymatic cascades and you know cellular interactions it's there's a whole lot of like mayhem going on here and this is a multi-organ disease this is a total body disease and no wonder your brain's not going to work the emotional circuitry in your brain is not going to work normally you know and so um i mean <laughs> The most um, amazing experience of this that I can recall was a man that came to me who called himself the bread man because he had a loaf a day. And, of course, he had, like, the Christmas tree in his blood. So, you know, he had fatty liver and a waist circumference and fasting into the whole lot, you know, pre-diabetes. And when I kind of suggested to him that maybe he shouldn't eat bread, you know, the tears kind of, you know, hit me in the face pretty much. Like he just kind of uh, was beyond anything that he could comprehend and, to my utter amazement, he came back um, a couple of weeks later. I wasn't expecting to see him again. <laughs> um, and um, and he said, I did what you said. And I thought, oh, wow, you know. And he goes, you didn't tell me about the euphoria. He goes, the autumn colours are beautiful. <laughs> I've never noticed them before. And... I just step out every side and I'm awestruck by the beauty of the world. And um, and he came back a few more weeks later beyond that too and just said, I'm waiting for this to end. Mm-hmm. It hasn't ended yet. And I don't think he was psychotic or manic, you know, bipolar. Or anything. I think he was actually just literally for the very first time in his life um, noticing love and natural beauty. And obviously he'd had a kind of a veil of, fuzz over his emotional circuitry you know from all of these diseases and had just been lifted and he just was you know kind of euphoric almost Mm, that's an amazing story and and i think and you have to go through this yourself individually right what i and i can't guarantee euphoria yeah yeah (laughs) if only (laughs) yeah but what i think is that the majority of people are walking through their day with a carb carbohydrate grain um, and seed oil induced uh, almost fog, brain fog. And they self medicate in the morning with caffeine and throughout the day with coffee. Um, and this whole, whole existence, this 
is related to this metabolic state of continual carbohydrate metabolism. And then when you do an intervention like low carbohydrate diet, like a ketogenic diet, like a carnivore diet, your body is flipping into predominantly fat metabolism. Mm. And for the first time in decades for a lot of these lot of patients, they they're able to think clearly for the first time. And mm. their body is operating on this in this different metabolic gear. And it's yeah. as you said, it's like a veil lifting. And, and it's always the, been there. You know, the machinery has just been there gathering dust. Mm. It, this is not like some esoteric fringe part of the human physiology. This is a core component. This is as though we basically had, you know, a, I don't know, like a energy system in our inside us that we basically were just ignoring the whole time and never actually pulled out of the box and switched on you know mm. and now that's what we're doing for the very first time and your body does it seamlessly you know this is kind mm. of to think that that if we don't have three meals plus three snacks every day that we're somehow just going to bend over and die i mean why are we here talking we wouldn't be if that was true because mm. Guess what? You know, throughout most of most of our existence on this planet, that hasn't been the case. There hasn't been the availability of um, such frequent intake of food. So it's normal for your body to switch over into utilizing its own battery. You know, why does it have a battery? You know, that's what our body fat is. It's just a rechargeable battery, like a phone or something has a rechargeable battery. You know, mm. and it should be able to charge and discharge. Like that should flow. You know, in two directions, right? And yeah. if you're gaining body fat, you're basically just stuck in charge mode, and you're not able to discharge your battery. Um, and then there's a the whole thing of like when I ask the question, rhetorical question, what form of energy does your body choose as its battery? It's fat. So I think the next rhetorical question is, well, do you think that your body has a, prob a problem that it doesn't like burning fat if it chooses to store energy in the form of fat? Of course not. It's very happy burning fat energy. So then why would we think that this is somehow bizarre, that a ketogenic diet is somehow bizarre when it's actually the format of energy your body chooses to store excess energy and to then retrieve energy when it needs it? You know, it's, it's just, to, and, and then, 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 you know, you think about these questions that you get from people that have only had their, still had their blinkers on. Hopefully they won't. Hopefully they'll take them off, but, um, not bad people, good people that have a blink, have their blinkers on is like, do you think it's dangerous long term to be burning fat? Like, goodness me, you know, it's again, this is the format of our, of our battery. Our rechargeable battery is fat. It's not a carbohydrate battery, you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, your body loves yeah. it. Yeah, and and I think the the important point, um, just going back to I guess the subjective improvement and feeling of health that patients experience, is that you have a situation where you implement this lifestyle intervention with that lowers carbohydrates and increases um, animal sources of of protein. You have an amazing improvement in not only objective markers of health so the waist circumference decreases the blood pressure decreases the the lipid markers that proxies of of uh insulin resistance like mm. hcl increase triglycerides decrease hba1c decreases fasting insulin decreases so across the biochemical spectrum you're having massive improvements in objective markers of of health and then not only that the patient is coming and telling you hey dr rob I feel the best I've ever felt. Mm. So, so you, you, we have to consider that holistically because the mainstream or the the predominant model of of prescription based care is so focused, laser focused, particularly on on biochemical mm. um, right. determinants of proxies of health, such yeah. as LDL or total cholesterol, and they're completely ignoring the 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 patient themselves and the patient's experience. It's so, that thing of us being gaslit. You know, mm. we're, 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 uh, we're mollycoddled and nurtured into believing we can't trust our body feeling. We have to go to a doctor to find out how our health is. We can't know it. And, and I think we do that at, well, we basically, I think there's a lot of that going on, you know, with all sorts of elements of our current world where we're kind of checking our thinking in at the door. You know? mm. Just kind of saying, well, it doesn't matter how I feel about anything. It's just basically what you tell me because you're the expert. Ah, uh, yeah, I really 
try to get away from that as much as possible. And 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 the patient is being let down because not only have they been let down in a nutritional sense, as as you mentioned earlier, Rob, you had type two full blown type two diabetes. Well, at the time, what you thought was two, type two diabetes, and the dietitian told you there are no more further improvements we can make. You are eating an optimal diet. Yeah. So from a lifestyle and initial dietary point of view, patients are being misled. And well, then I mean, I smell to rat, right? Because initially you have a lifestyle disease and your lifestyle coach, your dietitian is telling you you have a perfect lifestyle. So then why do you have a lifestyle disease? Something yeah. smelt wrong. Yeah. And then they go into the clinic and they they might feel bad and they followed the traditional, the existing dietary guidelines. They've got an HbO1c of 6.2. They're pre-diabetic. Yet they're told there's nothing wrong. Their waist circumference isn't even measured, and their mm. fasting insulin isn't mm. e- isn't even measured. So, and the, the patient the because the doctor themselves have has these markers, including the waist mm. circumference, and all the blood markers are similar with, in there because they just don't know. And it's not again. I, I really get away from trying to blame. I mean, there I, I would have been probably you know in a similar situation. My waist circumference was raised as well. So the last thing I can do is you know throw stones in glass houses. Throw stones. You know, so. mm. Uh, yeah you know but it just a lot of well-meaning on, people that are just basically have been hoodwinked yeah i just i just want to emphasize those two points because i want to really make it clear that average person who is trying to do the best for their themselves and their health is encountering obstacles and roadblocks at multiple levels and it appears though as if you if you want to be healthy if you want to have optimal markers of metabolic health and i want to get your definition on that rob you have to not only reject the the mainstream dietary paradigm but you also have to have a healthy skepticism for what most gps are telling you and and lots of people aren't prepared to it's not for everyone that 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 level of 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 i I guess rebellion against um the prevailing (laughs) narrative so yeah, yeah. It, it, it's very it's very difficult because this is a motorbike problem that most of australia is suffering from yeah. and the current system that we're stuck within um they're stuck within is is actively preventing them from getting any, yeah. any better look the thing that can neutralize that is a relationship you know and i think that's what i focus on with building with my patients as much as i can where i'm you know always even though i've got lots of regular patients that don't seem to go elsewhere and they, they, they could if they wanted to, who um, don't agree with what I'm recommending and not interested. Um, I've mentioned it to them gently a few times, but that's okay. And then I've had, you know, people who have taken a few years to give it a go and have not looked back but, you know, were seeing me regularly throughout that period and would say things like, well, I know what you would think you know, I should do, but um, I'm not happy to do that. So I think that relationship building is like one of the most powerful things and it can really neutralise, you know, I think, um, and I, again, I'm talking from my personal experience, is that when I trust my GP, that I'm prepared to be open-minded with what they have to say. So not everyone's ready and, you know, I'm happy to say to people, which I have done and will continue to do at different points, is I don't think you're ready. You know, sometimes people want to achieve better health, but too much is on their plate right now and they don't have headspace um, or they haven't learned the ability to discipline themselves to bring that headspace to the moment. So not everyone's ready for a whole raft of reasons. And what you point out is so true is that what I'm suggesting is for them to swim against the current. You know, and that that needs headspace in itself. You know, going with the flow is really easy. You can almost again, you can check check your thinking in at the door, and you can just look around and do what everyone else is doing. But the point is, it's a normal outcome to be sick. So if you want a normal outcome, which is like you know, I think was it the study in in America that looked at the adult population um, there, and I think it was eighty nine percent had markers, at least one marker of insulin resistance. So it was really what was it, I think, 11% that were found to be metabolically healthy, like 11%, you know, so basically 1 in 10 people are healthy. Um, so like I say, like, you know, 80 or 90% of the population are 
um, unhealthy. So if you want that normal outcome, eat normally. You'll get a normal outcome, you know. And unfortunately, if you want an abnormal outcome, which is health, you need to eat abnormally. You need to eat weird because normal will give you a normal outcome. So, Mm. yeah, this is not for everyone because not everyone's, you know, in a people are running around and, you know, have all sorts of things that are taking their attention, some of them necessary and some of them self-induced. You know, um, you know, there's a lot. Social media, I think, is probably more anti-social media and has a lot to blame. You know, people people's attention is being saturated and robbed, and, and they don't mm. have much left for it. So, like, you kind of you you do need if you're going to implement this, you need a little bit of headspace and mental energy to kind of make ch- you know change involves that, particularly when what you're doing goes against what maybe the rest, rest of your family might think is healthy or what um, you know your friends might think, and so. It's not for everyone and it's not for everyone all the time. People can sometimes go, well, actually, yes, I know I need to give this some effort and, but it's not right now because I've got too much on my plate. I'll come back to it in six months. So mm. that relationship I think is where, again, I, I mean, I, there's a lot of value I think in telling people that I'm not here to tell them what to do. Yeah. I don't see that as my role and the fantasy that, what I say people will do, I've given up long ago. <laughs> it doesn't work uh, as much as I might want it to. <laughs> so yeah. there's just no point, you know. It's about kind of working with someone. Mm. And I guess before we get too far along, for those who are wondering exactly what we mean or what dietary approach we're talking about, can you give an idea about what recommendations you typically give to someone who comes in either with with type 2 diabetes, fatty liver mm. disease, mm. or a sign of, of some form of metabolic dysfunction, what mm. are you recommending to them? I mean, yeah, if somebody's got, you know, all of those hyperinsulinemic or uh, features, you know, the, uh, yeah, fatty liver and diabetes, weight gain, etc. Uh, I think they just need to get rid of carbohydrates, you know. So basically sugars and starches need to be largely left out of the diet. Uh, and, and for those people, I'd definitely say that that includes fruit. You know, and a lot of people love fruit, you know, they're addicted to sugar and sweetness and that's fine. That's, you know, who we are, you know, as humans, we, a lot of people love sweet things. So we've kind of, you know, got to try and get that met, get that need met in a satisfied in a way that's not going to be too damaging. So berries are a good low, low sugar fruit there. Um, and certainly that the flip side of get rid of the carbs, the flip side is um, increase your meat. It's like, what, what are you going to eat instead? You know, we all need to eat something. The reason that we all started to get um, fat and diabetic in the 80s and 90s, um, in that order, fat in the 80s, diabetic in the 90s, was basically because we were told to not eat fat. We had to replace it with something. We, re- we replaced it with carbohydrate So um, and, and seed oils. So, yeah, I think those two approaches, you know, I, I certainly one of the first things I'll say, if not the first thing, is I need you to eat a lot more meat fatty meat, like full fat meat, um, and I need you to get rid of carbohydrates. You know? So, well, you know, that, that's what I recommend if you want to switch this around, change it over. So, you know, for vegans and vegetarians, that is very challenging. Obviously, I've never, to be honest, I've never had success with a vegetarian um, using this approach. I, I really think there's only so many eggs and only so much cheese that you can have before you just can't anymore for some reason but yeah people just really struggle to get because you know i'd be talking about like something like a dozen eggs a day you know is what they would need to get their protein requirements met not many people want to do that um so certainly you know for those people i'll have a discussion about inquiring what their motive and what their goal is in terms of being vegan and vegetarian i don't shy away from that i think it's important to just um be open in that discussion um interesting what people come up with and i mean i remember one woman who was in her mid-70s and she said when i asked her why are you vegetarian because i I suggested look love to be be proven wrong but i suspect as long as you stay vegetarian you're not going to lose weight and she was very overweight and um she was shocked by me saying that but um but basically when i asked her why was she vegetarian she said i have no idea 
<laughs> I've just been doing it for so many years that it's just what I do. But it doesn't need to be like that. I'm prepared to, if, it, if you're, what you're saying is true, I'm prepared to explore changing that. Um, yeah, again, like I said, it's not for everyone. So certainly, and, and I certainly think if someone's vegetarian, then it's worth giving a go. I think, you know, exploring certainly decreasing your carbohydrates, increasing your particularly animal sources of protein and fat is always going to be a good thing, um, even if it's not all the way beneficial. So, um, so I've just lost audio, Max. Oh, sorry. I, I think that anecdote speaks to human nature and, um, this tendency or a common tendency for people to, to have unexamined beliefs and to move through life in not only the, re- the realm of diet but a range of other topics with a yeah. bunch of beliefs that um, haven't been critically examined. And oh, look, I'm the first person just... to say I have a bunch of those as well, mm-hmm. you know, and they're, they're in my mm-hmm. filing cabinet to be gone through at some point. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I don't blame anyone for any of this as well, you know. And, and and look, at the end of the day, if someone says, no, I'm going to be vegan no matter what you say, respect. You know, we're, we're all here masters of our own body and destiny and, yeah. But all I can say is, like, if somebody, often, you know, someone who's vegan has got, like, you know, anxiety and depression and they're just not feeling very good, particularly not straight away, but maybe after a couple of years of doing it, um, it's pretty common you know, because we're not getting our needs met in terms of nutrition, plus we're getting a truckload of plant toxins all at the same time. So no. um, I guess, you know, I, I can just sort of point out that multiple studies have shown that the rates of anxiety and depression are, are pretty much double in vegans and vegetarians. So they're putting themselves behind the eight ball. And, again, it might be the fifth or tenth conversation that I will just mention that and leave it where someone says, you know what, I've hit rock bottom, I'm prepared to try something different. Hmm. So and that, that relationship again. Hmm. I mean, it sounds like another, I guess, a holy belief set that you're you're really challenging, which is mm. and identity. This, a whole lot of you know community. Mm. People will mm. bond with those other people that are doing the same thing, or or yeah. maybe long term culture. You know, it could just be you know ethnic, religious culture and and entire family structures that are you know, embedded in that. So, again, it's not for everyone, you know, and it's it's just about informing people of what's likely. And I guess what I can say for somebody like that who's, say, vegan, for example, who's got all of these metabolic diseases um, is that I'd love to be proven wrong. And if, if, if you do prove me wrong, please come and show me how because then I can learn. But I suspect you're not going to get the health you want if you keep going this way. You know, the way I see my job is to explain people's options and what I see from where I'm sitting to be the likely outcomes for those options and then to support them in their options, right? And, and, and Rob, I'd like you to, yeah, I'd, I'd like you to speak a little bit more about this idea of plant toxins. Um, it's a closely held belief um, by, by a lot of people that vegetables and, and plant matter are um, is not only beneficial but essential for human health. Uh, what what what's your take on that? And what would you say to someone um, who is perhaps um, holding that belief set? Well, um, it almost um, to me sounds magical. It, it's just a. I, I think it is a magical belief that vegetables are not magical. So we really need to shine a torch onto that element of this like the the point is we're red meat on the inside you know we're a mammal and um all mammals are red meat and we're not a bird or a fish we're definitely not a vegetable and so or a grain and so if you think about the inside of a mammal and what that looks like and is composing of everything that you need to build a mammal is available from another mammal everything all components are there if, if you get them in the right proportions. So first of all, um, you know, particularly, you know, we're, we're a mammal that, that whose gut handles meat really, really well. Um, look, 
you know, it's different if you're a herbivore because you have four stomachs which are massive fermentation chambers or other forms of um, fermentation. A gorilla is a, is a, is a herbivore. Gorillas are vegetarian um, and they're, they're, they're vegan. And, um, but, you know, they're, they're very different in their gut and you can tell that by just looking at a gorilla because they've got a big gut. You know, it's a big bloated abdomen, which is full of fermentation. It's a fermentation tank, basically. I- interestingly, their rib cage, if you look at their lower ribs, they're splayed. Their lower ribs are wider than their upper ribs. And that's because the shape is there to accommodate that big fermentation tank, right? Because you need fermentation if you're going to extract nutrition from plants, um, like a cow or a gorilla. Um, interestingly, though, humans' rib, rib cages are tapered. And if you look at our lower ribs, they're narrower than our upper ribs, right? And we have this little, very efficient gut and a little waist, you know, and, and actually our shape just externally, macroscopically is more like a big cat, you know, or any other kind of meat-eating animal where there's a really nice, you know, if you look at a, a, a cheetah or a lion or anything, they've got this little tapered waist, little, little gut. And the animals that have really narrow, small, Waists and guts, they're very efficient in extracting. Their, their nutrients are high in um, nutrient density. Sorry, their food's high in nutrient density. And um, basically, that, that's because what they're consuming is ready to go. You know, it's fat and protein, which is what they're made of, which is going to cross the gut membrane, enter the bloodstream, get assimilated and sucked into the tissues and turn into them. And this is kind of like our, our our guts very much along that same sort of line. You know, we have a very, the small intestine is where this magic happens, where, where what we eat then gets broken up, digested into its constituent parts and then crosses the gut membrane, enters the bloodstream. Our small intestine is very long. And our large intestine, where fermentation takes place, is very short. It's actually about half and double. So our our... Large intestine is half the length of a gorilla's large intestine where they're doing all this fermentation. Plus the gorilla has an extra bit of fermentation tank attached to that as well. Um, and their small intestine is half the length of our small intestine. So you kind of think we're really set up for eating, for assimilating nutrients we put in our mouth straight into our bloodstream to build us and grow us. So, um, yeah, but coming back to is there anything that you need to eat that you can't get from meat? Answer is no, because to build, it's a bit like, you know, but for example, you know, I mean, I find it quite funny to think that if you needed fiber to avoid constipation, then all tigers should be constipated. And then, of course, they're not. <laughs> you know, any, any, any creature that doesn't have a bowl of all brands should be constipated in that case, right? Well, of course, that's not true. Uh, so you don't need fiber to poo. And um, even vitamin C you can get from fresh meat. There's no vitamin C in preserved meat, which is why the sailors got scurvy. You know, that's, that's um, you know, once you dry and, and cure meat, vitamin C has gone. But if you get fresh meat, and particularly if you leave it pink when you're cooking it, then you're going to have some vitamin C. So really there's nothing that you need to get to build you. Um and so that's basically kind of, you know, I guess looking at what do we need? Do we need five vegetables a day? Well, that number is fabricated. Like there is no science on this. It's just been the number has been plucked out of the air, totally fabricated. So, yeah, um, we've heard it so many times. We just think it must be true. And, and this is the other thing I think is that people will often, and I think doctors are just as if not more susceptible to this way of thinking is that, we think um, how many other people believe this and if it's most, if it's 99% of people, it must be true. The reality is just because most people think something does not make it true. It can even be the vast majority, 99.999% of people might believe something. Even that doesn't make it true. So I think as you know, doctors often from conservative families that really kind of... Um, revere authority we go in you know um yes yes parents yes i will do what you say i will study and i will you know get a university degree right i, I will do you proud you know we, we want to please and our authority figures 
which is why a lot of people end up as doctors. And then the same thing happens to our lecturers and our, you know, learned professors that we just can't fathom that they might be wrong. We just have this reverence for authority, right? So I think that's why it's so hard to change doctors' minds because they, they think, well, hang on, what you're saying goes against what 99% of my colleagues believe. It can't be true. That that way of thinking is flawed. Mm. And And we are in the collectively in the place we are as a society with the rates of obesity and metabolic disease mm. in part because the m- most GPs and most doctors aren't addressing these critical foundational causes of um, of ill health. Absolutely. That- they're, they're, they're just basically believing what they've been told and for all the right mm. reasons, you know, they, they're trusting. Um, mm. Coming back to your question about plant toxins, you know, that, that's the second half of the thing. So the first one is that if you're going to eat lots and lots of plants and forego nutrient dense, highly bioavailable, highly accurate in its um, composition of, you know, nutrients in a way that's going to, like if you want to build red meat, you know, i.e. us, the most accurate reflection of the proportion of nutrients to do that is in red meat, right? Because you're getting everything you need in the right proportions. Um, Not that we're just muscle, which is why I think it's good to include as much of the animal as possible because you're getting a variation of nutrient profiles. But um, if you're not doing that, you need to eat a truckload of plants to try and make up all those nutrients. You're going to fail. You're not going to get there. You're not going to get everything that you need. Um, But in trying to do so, you're going to have a truckload of plant toxins. So there's the dual problems here of nutrient deficiency and cumulative plant toxicity. And they're there at the same time, right? And no wonder people are not feeling well when they're eating lots and lots of vegetables at the expense of meat. I mean... You know, so many people that are doing that, that are often eating meat because, you know, but they're, but they're really restricting because that's what they've been told to do, you know, and they're very obedient people. So it's really great. They're the ones I really enjoy working with, to be honest, because they're committed to trying something to better their health. They're really, you know, the only reason they're doing what they're doing, eating lots of vegetables, is because they were told to do it by so many people. They believe it must be mm-hmm. true. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I really enjoy working with those motivated sort of people. Um, mm. But yeah, you know, when you're eating all of these plants, you know, of course, plants don't want to be eaten either. Um, they're 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 not growing for our benefit. You know, they're growing to make their own babies, and uh, they, um, you know, they care for their babies like we care for our babies. You know, we we. You know, if we had a baby, we'd give our life for our baby, right? That's how much we care. Well, plants care for their babies too. And the problem for them is they're stuck in the ground. They can't run. They can't fight. All they have really are are, um, chemical defences. And, you know, this is, um, there are, you know, thousands of different molecules that have been described that are plant defence molecules. And... Plants particularly put them into their babies because they really don't want you to eat the next generation. So that's why people react to grains and legumes. You know, if you get people that eat a lot of legumes, often they feel terrible and they'll say, even I've spoken to vegans and they go, well, look, I know I should be eating this because I need my protein, but there's only so much I can have with lentils before it's a disaster. I'm on the toilet all night. It's like, well, you're, you're eating lots of the babies, so why wouldn't you be um, targeted by the plant? <laughs> you know, it doesn't want you to eat its babies. So, uh, you know, but the same is true for, you know, leaves, stems, roots. It, it, basically, the only part of the plant that it actually wants you to eat is the fruit, but even then um, it doesn't want every creature to eat its fruit because it wants a particular creature that's going to spread the seed, you know, far enough away, for example, which is why... A lot of fruits are very, very toxic and only a certain bird, for example, or a certain animal will have the um, right antidote in their gut to be able to handle that toxin that can take the seed far enough away. Right. So even with fruit, we need to be very, very respectful of the fact that many fruits are going to be either toxic or have low levels of toxicity. And what we call vegetables are basically mostly plant, plant, not fruit, although there are obviously some fruit that are vegetables as well. but you know, they're, they're, they're um, in, 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 in their natural form, they're usually quite toxic, but they've been cultivated to be less 
immediately and obviously toxic so that we don't eat them and get sick or die straight away. But the point is there's still low levels of toxin in them and some people are more susceptible than others to those low levels. And if you then have to supercharge your plant intake because you're not eating much meat or any meat, for example, you're just getting so much. Of, you know, you're eating a really nutrient, the, the really low nutrient density diet. You know, plants are not very nutrient dense, not very, very bioavailable. There's a lot of anti nutrients in them that inhibit digestion, absorption of nutrients, all part of the defense game for the plant. And if you eat all this, you're going to have to eat a lot of plants to try and get what you need. And you're not going to succeed on the one hand. On the other hand, you're going to potentially cop it in your gut and all different other ways um, with those defense molecules. So, I mean, I had a botanist as a patient once, you know, I started talking about this and luckily she just stopped me in my tracks and she just said, I know, I know, they're all poisonous whether we eat them or not. I was like, I can shut up now. <laughs> so that was interesting and, to that coming from her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I really want to get your insight on your, the therapeutic use of this, of a, of a exclude a diet that excludes plants because you if you propose this to most people they would suggest that you know that is inherently an unhealthy approach to eating sure but i th- i think that beyond internet anecdotes what is important is your therapeutic experience and your empirical experience using a carnivore or ex- a completely animal based diet and mm-hmm. the effect that you immediately see on biomarkers for health and, and disease control. So, can you give us a bit of an insight into what you've seen, um, patient-wise, who've improved who've improved on a carnivore diet? Look, it's very variable, and but a lot of people do really, really well. Um, certainly, just like uh, I mean, I think there isn't one way to eat for everyone. Everyone's got a kind of unique makeup, and we need to again have that lived experience. And so, for people, it's about kind of just exploring that and seeing what feels right and where they get the best results. But generally speaking, really limiting plant foods um, with maybe the exception of a few fruit, um, depending on tolerance, um, and really increasing, you know, fatty meat and preferably inclusion of some liver. Um, It's not for everyone, I guess, you know, some people get squeamish or whatever. Um, But our tastes can change. I think that's, that's the point. You know, so a lot of people will tell me that they don't enjoy meat, come back a few months later where they've really felt like freaking amazing since doing this, you know, and they'll say, I love meat. And people link how they feel to the taste. So taste can change. If you identify that this particular texture, food, whatever, flavour, really, like, makes me feel full of energy, calm, calm. it's easy to tap into joy you know, and I just have ants in my pants and I can't sit still because I've got so much energy, you know, um, then they will start enjoying that flavour. You know? So I think that's true for liver and other things as well. And it's just really important to, I think, keep pushing that envelope of just trying things that we know are nutrient-dense that are ancestrally um, appropriate. Um, yeah, so people... people I think as a general approach, like we're basically getting, what we want to do is get people's needs met. You know, so we want to get their nutritional needs met. We want to um, make sure that they're not just barely scraping the bottom of the barrel with their iron and their all different, you know, parts of nutritional. We want them to be abundant in these nutrients. You know, we don't want them to run out anytime soon if they have a higher demand for them one day. So... That's what this does. It really just floods their body with all the nutrients that they need. And people's bodies love it. Yeah, you know, it's it's um incredible how with especially it's the it's most stark with the vegans and vegetarians that choose to give this a go. They have always consistently said come back after a few months and said, Well, my my gut is so different. I just feel so much better in my gut. It's not I'm not bloated. All the bloating's gone. Um, I don't feel so like there's a there's a there's like a party, but not a good party, like a something like there's you know a riot almost in my gut, right? Um, because that's how they felt. They just you know the toilet was their friend, you know, and they were just like 
the gut was just not happy. And yeah, they just kind of, again, it comes back to that kind of, I think, eating a species appropriate diet, you know, where, where, where we just look at this, the shape of our gut and the makeup of our gut. It's not a herbivore's gut. And you pump it full of plants and people really struggle. You know, think about too that the fact that we can't digest fiber. We don't absorb it. We reject it. You know, your gut says like, why did you give me this? What am I going to do with this? Like, why? We have to push it out, right? So when you're eating vegetables, half of what you're eating, you're going to have to reject. You're just giving your gut a whole lot more work, you know. And if you are someone who's constipated, then you turn a small problem into a big problem because you're going to have to make so much more poo. And, and, and it's going to be bulked. And the last thing that you want, if you want to get something through a small hole, is to make it big. It's, it's so counterintuitive. So, uh, uh, well, I mean, this approach is counterintuitive, but it, it really, when you explain it like that, you know, um, people that end up eating an animal-based diet with very little fiber will, will find that their stools change a lot. They'll make a lot less but they won't feel like there's something there that, that they can't get out. They'll just feel like they make a little bit of poo and they're empty. They're good, you know. And that's the thing is that when you eat meat or animal foods is that the vast majority of what you're putting in your mouth is going to become you. It crosses into your blood. It gets assimilated into your tissues. You don't make a lot of poo. You don't reject a lot. And, and so you make a lot less. And what you make is a lot kind of thinner. It, it's actually good for people with constipation because it's not bulked. It's kind of more slippery and moldable and it empties itself, you know, rather than you having to push. Um, so it's a great approach for those sorts of people. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And, um, I mean, for, for people listening who have struggled with constipation um, or are struggling with a un, nonspecific kind of health complaint or just not feeling optimal, um, it's something to definitely consider trying mm. um, first to obviously cut out the refined foods and as Dr. Rob said earlier, the the starches, the seed oils and the sugar. But if you potentially are still having unresolved symptoms, then removing all plant food and trying a period of a fully exclusionary uh, animal-based diet where you're only eating products of animals preferably with with organs in there um you that's something you should you could definitely try um and it, it's my opinion and my my experience that a lot of people are suitable and they have great results on on an animal-based diet for a period of time in which they heal the initial problem that, that I, I guess drove them to seek out um such a strict diet and then from there they have the option the choice to either reintroduce certain low toxicity plant foods like avocados like berries mm. perhaps fruit and it's my opinion that seasonal consumption of fruit is local seasonal consumption of fruit is, is the most ideal um and then they can see how they feel and 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 their approach should always be titrated to su their subjective feeling of health and and any symptoms mm. that that are recurring Correct. yeah um so so it's a it's a constant process of an end of one trial and error. It is. Where yeah. we're re removing, adding, removing, adding, testing. It's a science project. You have yeah. to be your own science project. Yeah. And by going through this process, you find what is optimal for you. And what that that's powerful and it should be supported by the mainstream medical yeah. and scientific um, establishment, but it isn't. Instead, we're asked to outsource our individual decision-making to aggregated scientific findings in yeah. a randomized trial, in an yeah. observational trial, yeah. that often has limited external validity in that it's not applicable to us as an individual. Yeah. So we're getting like a a really fundamental, I guess, epistemological point about science here, which is why are you outsourcing your health decision making framework and processes to literature or scientific findings that are probably not even relevant to you as an individual? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, I really like what you're doing, Rob, with with that that approach to your patients because you're really empowering them. You're giving them the option. You're saying you're your own boss. I'm not telling you what to do, but this is what I've seen works. Yeah. This is what works for a lot of people. It's up to you to experiment and find out right. what, what's most suitable. Spot on, spot on. And then, then you start to develop a stronger sense of trusting your own feelings rather than, you know, feeling like you've been gaslit 
into thinking that what you feel is different to what you're told is right. Therefore, there must be something wrong with you. And, you know, like those people that feel like they've failed those diets, you know, and, and, um, that's crazy making. Like that, that just will, if you, if you let it, if you take it to the extreme, it will just put you, you know, into a, like you, you'll have a mental breakdown, right? Because you can no longer trust your own feelings. Like you'll, you'll go crazy. So yeah. we're going in the opposite direction here where we're saying to people, no, like what you notice in terms of your subjective feeling is probably true. So that, um, you know, like I can sort of equate it very easily. You know, if someone, and, and that's probably true from a point of view of physical health. So your risk of having all sorts of physical diseases is probably going to be based on how you feel today. Health today is the best predictor of health tomorrow. Even if your numbers are not right, like even if you've got a high LDL or something, right? Um, we can talk about that later, <laughs> another day maybe. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, that sense of what, what makes me feel fantastic, I think is, the most valuable way to kind of progress this yeah um and and from what i my experience i mean eating someone who's likes seafood or is open-minded to to eating foods like oysters fresh oysters um and liver they will tell you that that is the most energized happy um just subjectively um joyful Mm. uh, state of being and it's after eating these type of nutrient dense foods, which have all the bo- most bioavailable available forms of of key nutrients that we need for our bodily processes. So um, that that's that's great, Rob. That's fascinating, and and I guess we're we're coming up to to almost past an hour now. Do you have any final thoughts about um, that you'd like to share, or or I guess advice for someone who perhaps is still seeing a regular GP? Um, but wants to make more lifestyle-based changes that uh, at the moment aren't, I guess, endorsed. So uh, what, what advice would you give them? For- I, I would always say um, talk about, and this is not just with your with your doctor and other clinicians, but with your family and friends and everyone else, when people still start expressing concern that maybe eating all this meat might give you bowel cancer or whatever, you know, I mean, the evidence for that is just junk. It's, it's absolute unscientific stuff you know, talk about that another day. But um, I would always bring it back to um, I'm, I'm the, the idea that I'm doing, what, I'm exploring what works well for me. Uh, and by continuing to talk about the narrative that everyone's different and maybe this is not for you or for your other, if you're talking to a doctor, your other patients. But I've noticed that I'm getting lean and have lots of energy and I feel really strong and calm when I'm doing this. So I understand that you might have a different opinion, but for me, this has worked. So I'm just experimenting on what's working for me. I think that's the best way, you know, and that way you're not being, um, you're not on your soapbox. You know, you're not trying to uh, tell your friends and family and doctor that you know best although you probably do, <laughs> but, you know, keep that under your hat. Um, uh, that, that's the thing. I think if you just personalise it, say, you know, take it away from a belief system for other people and keep it personal. And, I mean, change yourself before you change others and before you change the world, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, um, that's very appropriate um, advice and, and a great place to to end it for this time so um yeah rob just g- give us a handoff for people who might want to get in touch or get some treatment with you or um ha- if they've got type 2 diabetes or, or they want some care what services are you currently offering for patients that yeah so i've got, got australia wide remote care um clinic which of uh, course called diversa health uh, so diversa health dot d i v e r s a diversa health dot com dot au and 
I can see people remotely through Zoom and there's a whole team of health coaches, which are a combination of dietitians, nurses and other health coaches that will help people sort of ex- explore this way of eating and, and troubleshoot all those common things that people, you know, that we see time and time again, that are, whether it's how to incorporate it into a family life or travel or preferences and the whole bit. So they, they do the predominant amount of health coaching and then I'll do the medical component with the blood tests and that kind of thing. Um, I'm also a GP in Albury, Albury-Wodonga, um, on the Victoria-New South Wales border, but I only see local people there. Uh, so, yeah, other, otherwise I think diverse health is the way to go. And, uh, look, it's, uh, if you, I mean, um, I am biased, obviously, you know, it's my clinic, but the trust pilot, um, reports, which none of which have been gardened, you know, or, or encouraged. This is simply people's honest expression, self-generated, uh, really kind of bring a tear to my eye. You know, people are very, very, have got a lot of benefit from it. So that's really exciting to be able to deliver. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, and I couldn't rec- recommend Diversa highly enough and it, it seemed it's the most accessible and the most um, advanced, I guess, remote healthcare program to help reverse your diabetes with with diet and lifestyle. So thanks, Rob. We got we got some more to talk about that we'll we'll pick up on a, another episode. But thanks very much for your time um, for and you, sharing all, you, all all your knowledge with everyone. So My pleasure. Yeah, we we very much appreciate it. Cheers. Mm-hmm.